Today, everybody is talking about artificial intelligence. In the field of the car industry, in the health industry, you hear things about artificial intelligence. And this is supposed to produce things, incredible things, nobody ever thought before. But how is this possible? Machines are programmed by human, after all. Hello, I'm Luc de Brabandère. I'm teaching philosophy of science in various universities. And today, I'm with Merwan Deba. Merwan is director of a Huawei lab in Paris, completely dedicated to algorithm and mathematics. Merwan is studying applied mathematics for many, many years. So it's interesting to know in the end, what do we mean by artificial intelligence? To explain this, let me give you a very simple example. Suppose you want to kick a ball at a given distance d, say 450 meters. In this case, you have two options. The first option is that you have at your disposal the, what we call the Newton equations. In this case, you solve those equations and you're able to find the angle with which you can kick a ball at a given distance here, 450 meters. It turns out that in many cases, especially in a telecommunication network, it's extremely difficult to get those Newton equations which explain the behavior of the network. The other option which uh, is considered today by the machine learning community is around the topic of big data. What you do in this case is that you kick the ball many times and you start registering in a table the distance versus the angle with which you kicked the ball. By having that huge data and numbers, next time you're asked to kick the ball at a given distance, say basically 450 meters, then you will start looking in that table if that distance is already there. This is already known in our community since many years. It's called data mining. There's no intelligence, but still you need to come up with some very sophisticated algorithms which enable you to do a fast search. In the specific case I'm talking about, you will need basically not to search one meter, two meter, three meter, but you will clusterize your data and know immediately that 450 meters is in the class 400, 500. Now, if the distance is not there, and this is where we talk about intelligence, you will start doing some kind of linear combinations of the distance which were already existing in your database to find what are the new linear combinations you need to do in the angle domain to find the, the angle with which you can kick the ball. This linear regression that you're doing basically is at the heart of many machine learning algorithms. It requires some sophisticated mathematical tools and basically enables you to find the angle with which you can kick the ball. In the terminology of machine learning, or AI, we call this a black box that you train with the data, where the input basically is the distance that you need to find, and the output is the angle, basically, that is given to you. Now, this technique seems quite uh, outstanding in the sense that uh, you're able, with AI techniques, to recover Newton equations. However, you have to have in mind that there's a couple of caveats with that method. The first caveat, of course, is when you start training, basically, your system when it's sunny and you're asked to kick the ball when it's rainy. We have here, basically, discrepancy, which requires to retrain every time the conditions changes. So this has a cost. The second caveat of this method is also what we call the input-output parameters, which are not necessarily known. In the example that I gave, there's not a mapping or a unique mapping between distance and angle. There's also what we call the velocity, which is important, and the initial velocity with which you kick. And this is not something that is immediate to know when you start tackling a problem. The third caveat of this method is, of course, the generalization problem. Imagine you start learning or kicking the ball basically on Earth, and you're asked after to kick the ball on the moon. It's extremely complicated to extrapolate from the existing data to be able to know what are the governing laws that will be required on the moon. This option or this point of view of replacing models with big data has had a huge impact in our discipline. Typically in voice recognition, for many years, people have spent time trying to model the larynx and trying to find a way 
on how voice was emitted. It turns out that this was unsuccessful. The first successes appeared when we decided to stop modeling but see voice recognition as what we call a classification problem. We register many, many data voices, and next time there is a new pattern of voice appearing, we do some kind of correlation to be able to infer on what was the sound which was emitted. The techniques of AI are not new, and they date back to a big conference in 1956 where top mathematicians gave their view, such as Shannon and Turing. It went into a couple of winters since 1956, and since the year 2000, we're seeing basically a big outbreak of uh, AI techniques in our community. And this is for three main reasons. The first reason is basically the huge amount of data and storage capability that we have today, and that enables us basically to have the capability of crunching that data. The second also main reason is the computing capability that is available today, and which enables us, of course, to also crash that data. The third reason is basically the machinery of the algorithmic techniques that we have available today, which enables us to do inference. Today, many mathematicians are working on new mathematical techniques that can provide trustworthy and explainable AI algorithms, which are at the same time efficient and implementable. Watch the full series in the YouTube channel. What makes it tick?